In the face of an unpredictable future, we are all called upon each and every day to think of out-of-the-box ways to tackle challenges to our environment, well-being, or how to find your submerged bicycle by scrolling through social media. Welcome to the Grand Challenges Podcast, a show about inspiring individuals who are stepping up to these challenges and are here to share stories about their own personal journey towards making our world a better place. I'm your host, Peter Marcus Bach, a researcher and data enthusiast with a passion for connecting across expertise and providing you access to knowledge from the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. My guest today is Dr. João Paulo Leitao, a senior researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology and lecturer at ETH Zurich. João has been active in the areas of urban flood risk assessment and urban water asset management research for over 13 years and actively looks for new ways to combine numerical models, spatial planning, and a good dose of storytelling to create future cities. Today on the show, we explore João's early research journey, how his Portuguese heritage has actively inspired his work, and how he is using flood models, unconventional data sources, and machine learning beyond engineering design. For more information, refer to the show notes over at petermbach.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining and please enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, João. Hello. Hi. Hi, Peter. Glad to have you here. And uh, yeah, you're, you're episode number one. So you're helping me start off this interesting journey, which hopefully will uh, last quite a few episodes. Yeah, cool. I think it's a cool idea. It's uh, also a privilege being here. So let's make uh, the first episode fun. So then the other ones can also be funnier or at least as fun as this one. Yeah. And I, I was preparing my, my protocol to try and figure out what to talk to you about. And, you know, it's we, we're not going to just spend the whole hour on just, you know, boring or bland research. Not, that, not to say that yours is bland, but I, I think there's certainly a lot of things that we've shared in the last few years that I feel have shaped you as who you are and just made you this interesting person that makes me want to talk to you. So uh, I figured that's you know a perfect place to start. And one thing I wrote in that uh, in the comment to you this morning was a fish dipped in olive oil and baked in the oven. Uh, and I remember you serving me that when I visited you once and I was quite amazed at how much oil you can put in. But this reflects in a way where you come from and the culture you've grown up with, which is super interesting. Uh, and I've never been to Portugal myself, but maybe share a bit about how that sort of shaped who you are today and any interesting anecdotes. Okay, good. Yeah, Peter. So this fish is cod, salted cod. And I, I, I dare to say that there's no Portuguese that hasn't yet uh, tried cod, salted cod. It's kind of, um, I don't say the official national dish, because also there are many ways of uh, cooking this cod, this salted cod, which is different from Central Europe, for example, cod. And there are many ways. So then it's if you're Portuguese, you know what, what, what I'm talking about. You also know now. You have uh, tasted it. But this is something that every Portuguese knows. And it's very traditional uh, for Christmas time. So at least for Christmas, people, most of the people, most of the Portuguese sit around the, the same the table with, with the family and have a cod. So this is something. The other thing is what we prepared to you for the, for Christmas was Christmas time, by the way, was I think a combination of two things very Portuguese. So one of is a salted cod and the other one is olive oil. And this is just one of the recipes of uh, how to prepare a cod. So we uh, cook, we boil, we yeah fry the cod uh, in the olive oil. And I like it. No, it was certainly very tasty. And uh, I remember that night we spoke a lot about Portugal and the history. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, a lot of that, it really reflects a lot of the interests that you have in the work you do. Uh, in particular, you know, I remember you telling me a lot of stories about the Azores, uh, where I think your wife is from and you yourself are from Lisbon, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, correct. And yeah, so I feel like that's also where you started your journey on your research path, where you got your master's from. Correct. Yeah. So my background is environmental engineering. And uh, there are two things that really uh, popped up very early in the course of this environmental engineering at, uh, at Lisbon University. One was that I'm not very keen to spend my life in a lab. This was a possibility. Uh, and the other one was I was very, very happy playing with computers and think about planning. And uh, this is how it developed into a master of geographic information systems that I did uh, after my, well, actually after working uh, in during one, one year in, in the industry. 
And then, uh, yeah, this is where it started. Uh, Instituto Superior Técnico, uh, by that time, was part of the Technical University of Lisbon. Now they merged the two universities, and now it uh, belongs to the University of Lisbon. And this is, this is how it started. An environmental engineer with some interests in water and also planning. And so you had the height. Hydraulics, hydrology background from your education and then decided to go spatial by then looking at geographic information systems shortly after that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember. Well, there's, everyone has some, some these events that we remember from, from the university and also from other events in, in life. And we had uh, hydraulics lectures with one of the most famous hydraulic engineers in Portugal. Uh, his name was Antonio Quintela. And uh, among many things that we've learned... I keep always saying one thing to my fellow colleagues and students that engineers never say never and never say always. So it was really a, a motivation. So this, this professor, Professor Quintella, truly to, to bring these things into my, my interest. So it started there, uh, hydraulics, and then he moved into sanitation with another professor that I really has very good memories. He's still alive and will, will stay alive for many years, I hope, uh, so Professor José Saldanha Mach. And then it started there, how to plan, how to make cities uh, safer regarding uh, water issues, namely flooding. And then was also the combination between this planning, planning aspect at the GIS with the technicalities of hydraulics and hydrology and so on. So this is really my background that ended up in a PhD on urban flood modeling and, and risk uh, management. And that PhD basically brought you to Imperial College in London. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, also an interesting journey. So my PhD was funded by the Portuguese uh, Science Foundation, FCT. And colleagues at university in Lisbon told me, yeah, you can talk with this professor. And this professor was uh, Professor David Butler, that by that time was at Imperial College before he moved to, to Exeter. And then I exchanged a few emails. It was good. We, we prepared the proposal, some ideas. And at the end, he said, okay, yeah, João, you know, this, this topic, I may be moving somewhere else. You should talk with Professor Cedo Maksimovic. And then it happened. So I moved uh, to Imperial to do my PhD in 2006, uh, supervised by Professor Cedo Maksimovic, and it was really a very interesting journey. And now you're based in Switzerland. Tell me a bit about the bridge between London and okay. coming to Switzerland. We had very, so I moved uh, to London with my wife, and we have very, very good time. Four years of very nice time there. Although Joanna, my wife, keeps telling me, yeah, you said it was a good time. It was, you were always complaining about the PhD and the tasks and so on. But, <laughs> well, it's uh, something of the past. I, I, I really keep good memories. And then for family reasons, we, we did move to Lisbon after the PhD. And then there I worked for the Portuguese Civil Engineering uh, Lab uh, in Lisbon. I also had a very, very nice three and a half years, uh, moved a uh, significant topic. And uh, this brought me into asset management, urban water asset management, which is kind of my second leg in research. I was also uh, now lecturing this topic at uh, ETH Zurich and try again to bridge or bring together planning spatial ideas into this asset management uh, topic from Imperial to Lisbon and then to Switzerland. So after three and a half years in Lisbon, lots of good activities, lots of interesting interactions with uh, water utilities. But we are at the peak of an economic crisis in Europe. And I thought, well, uh, maybe why not trying another time to move abroad? And here we are in Switzerland for more than nine years, Wow, which is impressive to me, <laughs> I have to admit. And uh, with, uh, with a nice family, we are now not two, Moving back to Lisbon, we are four in Switzerland with nice friends around as well. So I'm happy. How do you find the language barrier? Because you're learning German as far as I understand. And we're in Zurich at the moment. And German is pretty much the, the dominant, also Swiss German is the dominant language here. Yes. Uh, Deutsch ist nicht einfach. German is not easy. Yes. German is not easy. Plus, we learn German at school. So I have lessons or lecture lessons at school. But the problem is that when we go, we, when we come out to the real life in, in Zurich, it sounds as a completely different language. So it's challenging per se learning German, at least for me. And in addition to that, people practice a different language in Zurich, although they write the same way, 
but it sounds a completely different uh, language for a foreigner. So it's coming slowly. I can now understand. I can make a few jokes, basic jokes in German, but uh, it's it's okay to to start living. It's a little bit more than uh, than enough for surviving in German. So it's it's starting to be okay for living in in German. Yeah, I feel you can get by quite easily. Although I myself am German and I speak the language, but when I first moved to Zurich, I also struggled to try and understand uh, the Swiss German language. So I can I can totally understand that uh, you would have uh, had a few difficulties at the start. But I guess your kids, they learn Swiss German, so they can always help you uh, with communicating as well. Yeah, completely right. And then, so my kids speak Swiss German, I would say, as their first language, which in a way makes me a little bit um, unhappy, <laughs> <laughs> especially when one of when my son says, well, you know, Portuguese is so difficult. I said, no, no, it's not. But I, it's completely understandable. So then they, they live and they dream in, in German now. It's, it's, uh, I don't say they are native speakers, but this is really the main, main language. But they're quite fluent. They do everything as a normal kid do in Swiss German and a little bit of uh, German as well. How do you find the ability to speak multiple languages helps you in engaging with industry, with practitioners in the work you do, or at least just for the outreach activities? This is where, uh, well, there are two reasons uh, to learn German in my case. And I think it may apply to other people living in foreign countries. One is the obvious one. When, when we live in a place and we do have a family, there's very small things that if we don't speak the language, we don't understand. We cannot follow. School things, for example, and so on. Or the simple thing of taking care of my son and his friends. There's many things I cannot track, cannot follow. So this is one personal thing. And the other thing, as you're saying, Peter, I think it is key to engage with industry, to engage with partners. Although universities, it's uh, everyone speaks English. And I would tend to say that in at ETH Zurich, uh, most of the meetings will be or hard in, in, in English, but not being able to have a proper conversation in German or in a foreign or the language of the country where we live in raises some, some walls and some barriers. Hmm. But I have to say, because of the arrangement of languages in Switzerland, people deal with these things, these language barriers very well, very, very well. Yeah, that's, that's very good to see. And so we, we started this talking about fish and then we went through your journey to Switzerland. And of course, we're not going to you know, forget about the, the topic that we started with. So you're in Switzerland now. And of course, you go back to visit family. You go back to Lisbon. You go back to, to the Azores uh, every now and then, once a year, more or less. Uh, so th that's usually you know, bringing back some of your heritage, mm -hmm. right? So do you do you still do you use it as a real holiday time to recuperate or do you still engage a lot with Portugal? It's a it's a good question. So first of all, the feeling of going home when I go to Lisbon or to Castelo Branco, which is another city where my parents are coming from, or to the Azores where my uh, my my wife's family is coming from. It's really a feeling of going home, uh, and it's moving. It's it's not a static thing. It's clearly moving from over time. At the beginning, there was no question. Holidays, we would go to Portugal. That was it. For many reasons, so visiting family, staying with friends, and so on. Now, we start questioning ourselves. So if we always go to Portugal, it means that we don't go to other places. So this thing is, is moving a little bit. But still, going to Portugal, and if we have enough weeks, two or three weeks at least, it's a nice place to relax, despite all these... Uh, Busy times visiting friends and family and so on, but it's still it's still a nice place to go and relax after a few months of busy work. And certainly a lot of fun stories to tell once you're back. Uh, one of them I can remember, or well, actually there's a few of them, but especially concerning the Azores in Tesaira. Uh, and I, I figured this would be a good opportunity for you to share a few of these because I <laughs> feel like it's to me it's quite entertaining. It's a very different kind of insight into what life is like on these kinds of archipelagos. Uh, one of them in particular that I guess we could start with is when you travel to the Azores, you have multiple islands, but of course on the islands themselves, you got the infrastructure and you need to get around when you spend your time there. In particular, I've heard the story about getting a car in the Azores. Tell me about this. Yeah. So basically the Azores is a group of nine islands in the middle of the Atlantic, about two and a half hours flight from Lisbon. And I think three, four hours from the 
east coast of the US. So basically, most of the things need to be brought there from fuel, from, from everything. And it's not easy. It's not easy. So it takes uh, five of four or five days by ship to get there from Lisbon. As I said, flight two and a half hours, but it's expensive to bring bulky items in the, in the planes. And cars are a bulky item. So it's limited the number of cars uh, available for to rent. For many, many years, the Azores were a little bit outside the touristic destinations. But new low-cost companies started flying to the Azores uh, five years ago or something, before COVID, 2018 or 2017. And there was a boom of tourism, which means there's not cars for everyone. So, true. And to be honest, without a car, it's a little bit tough to visit these islands. So it's good to have a car. To go here and there and then visit here. and then. So there's another way of finding a car. Calling friends and family, people that we do know, and asking, well, we do need a car for this week in August or July or September. And there's usually always a solution. There's always someone that we don't know in person, but is a friend of a friend of a friend uh, that uh, will have a car available. And it's great. I would not call it a black market. I'll find it, I call it a solution. (laughs) (laughs) So you got these private car rental services on an island? No, we do have friends that let us use their cars. This is the thing. And so you you pay them after you you rent the car for a few days and uh, do they, they take responsibility for the cars? Yes, we don't pay for the car. We give them some uh, free money for being able to use their cars. And this allows you to get around. Yes, that is great. It's really great. It's, uh, it's easy. It's fun. It's, uh, we end up uh, meeting the owners of the car as well, or a friend of a friend. It's always, always cool. So if I were to go to the Azores for holiday, would I be able to use this kind of service? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just need to write the right person. Hmm. You need to know the right person. I guess it's one of these small islands where everyone knows everyone, isn't it? Uh, yes. I don't know if everyone knows everyone, but... Everyone knows someone that would know someone else. So this that's person's friends, uncles, moms, dads. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's definitely that. That's always like the And that's the nice thing about these closely knit societies or closely yeah, knit Yeah, we, um, we should not forget that, I don't know, trying to repeat the stories my mother-in-law tells us. In the 60s, most of the planes connecting the, the Azores to Lisbon were planes that would come from the US, from North America, that would need to stop in the middle of the Atlantic for a technical stop and then would take passengers after the technical stop into Lisbon. And this would mean at least a day of uh, traveling within the islands because people would be in one island, would need to fly to another island, usually to Santa Maria with the longest uh, long uh, runway. And then they had to wait for the plane to show up in the sky. And it could be 11 p.m., 2 a.m., 5 a.m. And there was no internet connection, no flight rider uh, website to know where the, pl- the plane was. That's a very flexible schedule. Well, we have to have the, the time <laughs> to wait for the plane to, to arrive. And I remember you telling me the story about uh, in the olden days with the sailors where they had a certain window to get to the island. Yes. So this is correct. Uh, it's ve- I don't know exactly how it works. I would need to, to look into the books or internet. But the winds are very favorable during almost six months of the year to cross from east to west. And the other six months of the year, it's easier to go from west to east. There's uh, one famous uh, marina in the Azores, in, in Fayal, where sometimes people arrive and because the, they arrive late or whatever, or they take longer in the islands because it's a nice place to be, they cannot return or they don't, cannot continue the journey, the sailing journey immediately. So they leave the boat there, fly back, uh, do another year or six months of uh, work, and then fly to Fayal again and continue the journey. I, I remember this cafe because you brought me a coaster once from this, uh, well, this Marina's Cafe because yeah. it, it has my name on it. <laughs> True. And you're actually wearing a, a T-shirt with it. Exactly. Uh, by chance today, but it is correct. By pure chance. Nah, I'm sure you, you <laughs> needed some inspiration from the Azores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
but I guess there's certainly a lot of funny anecdotes um, and also just resources on the island, right? One one of the interesting things of this cafe, so it, it's known for the, the sailors to meet, and uh, these are we are talking about a small island, and this, for example, this cafe, this Peter Cafe Sport, the name of the cafe does this post service to sailors, so they can and receive packages that are sent from all corners of the four corners of the world that arrive there at the island to this cafe and then uh, the owner of the cafe makes this service to the, to the sailors that stay longer in, in the island or waiting for the good wind or it's uh, interesting interesting uh, community yeah but i guess the, there's the other story as well of the atms <laughs> yeah yeah you, yeah, you yeah. want to share a bit about that yes so yeah I don't know exactly. This is this happened to a family member that lives in in Terceira, in the second most populated uh, island in the Azores. And then maybe during the nineties, should have been during the nineties. There was a, a, a Sunday afternoon. This is what uh, what he told me that he went to withdraw some cash from the cash machine from the ATM, and there was no cash in there. Oh. And basically, there was one or two uh, ATM machines or uh, cash machines in the island. So there's a, the city and there's another city uh, 20 kilometers away. But maybe there was only, by that time, only one, one ATM in the largest city of the island. And then the, the, there was a message uh, this afternoon. Sorry, um, we don't have cash. Machine has cannot really give you cash back. So please travel to the near, nearby uh, ATM machine. Which is Every, on the other island. Everything is fine if you are in Portugal mainland, because maybe 10 kilometers away, 20 kilometers away, you can drive there. We are talking here in this case, also 20 kilometers away. The problem is that there's a Atlantic Ocean in, the, nah. in between, which is not very easy to, to get there. The closest uh, cash machine was in São Jorge, which is about, uh, I think, uh, 20 kilometers away or so. And that's how long by ferry? First of all, there's no ferry. Oh, there's no ferry. Only during summer. Oh, so you have to swim there. You have to swim or have your own boat. But <laughs> the ferry in summer would take uh, four hours. Oh, wow. Three, four hours. So that's it. You can fly, right? If there's a flight waiting for you. Uh, and then it will be uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes maximum. But uh, it's not handy, right? Not it's just handy. a cash machine uh, with cash. And that was it. Nowadays, it's it's a completely different picture, right? There's much more cash machines, and uh, it's 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 a uh, yeah, it's the the progress also reached the the islands. It's a completely normal place, um, normal city, all the all the infrastructure, many cash machines, different banks, well, everything like a normal city. But I guess that's a lot. Of, uh, there's a lot of charm to living on small islands, island communities like that, like in the Azores, especially now with a lot more convenience built in, it still feels because you're separated geographically from the mainland. Uh, there's a very different feeling to life there, isn't there? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think I haven't thought too much about it. I really like going there, first of all. But without thinking too much and not an expert in, uh, in how people behave, but I think that perhaps three, at least three types of people those who cannot live in, a, in the island, they feel the, the pressure of being completely isolated, surrounded by the sea. So for these people, they land there and then they leave the island as, as soon as they can. So this is one aspect. Then there's the others that uh, would love to go there to spend holidays with a family and a nice place. And I know <laughs> have someone like that at home, which is also okay. And then there are the others that like to live there or that move there from from. Portugal mainland, for example, and like to live there. And I think for this third group, there's something that's really, they, they, they need to have a hobby to really spend time because there's not much to do as in a, in a big city. But there's many things to be done outside. We have a sea, we can swim, dive, we can run, we can hike, go to the cinema as well. So there's lots of things to be done, but the people need to find a hobby because otherwise it's too much time, too much free time. Yeah. Now the whole the whole reason we've been talking about Tessaira, because I, I know it's close to your heart, not just from your own personal life, but also in the work you do. You know, you, you work in flooding, flood modeling, trying to improve the use of these kinds of models, taking advantage of different kinds of data sets. And one of the studies that in particular has been very interesting to me is the work that you did with a historian uh, in the island of Tessaira. 
settled around the 1400s, between the 14 and 1500s, you actually try to use the flood models and the tools you have available to you to help history. Tell us a bit about that. Yes. So first of all, this has been quite a joyful work. And I have to say it's kind of a family business. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so Antonieta, the other author of this this work, is a, is an architect and that looks into history. So she bridges architecture and history. And she's really spent most of his uh, research life on looking into how the cities in the Azores started or how the urbanization started in the Azores. She's also moving, I think, to other islands in this area. So we have the Azores, Madeira, the Canary Islands, and a little bit Cape Verde in the so further south. But uh, she, she did uh, her uh, PhD thesis on, on Terceira. Actually, she's from Terceira, from Angra do Heroísmo, the city. So she's cousin of my wife. That uh, that's explains uh, most of things. And then in her PhD thesis, she thought or she investigated, she tried to find out where the city has started. And there's a, there's a theory that, it's, that says that starts in what is now called the Praça Velha. So if we translate this thing, it's the old square. So the largest square of the city. But Antonieta thinks that it started somewhere else, not very far from this place, maybe 100 meters away, 200 meters away. And she brought up some, some, some hypotheses to support or some evidence, trying to find some evidence to support her hypothesis that uh, the, the city or the first buildings of the city started not exactly in Praça Velha, but where is now uh, the, the, the cathedral, the, the largest church mm -hmm. of the city. And one of the aspects was the frequency of flooding in Praça Velha. It's a little bit too technical, but basically Praça Velha is located at the bottom of, is surrounded by three hills. So if we think about when it rains, this location collects water from the three hills and then has a, a kind of a line, a stream, a creek that we don't see anymore that connects this, this place to the sea. And uh, Antonieta was trying to say, well, but it doesn't make sense, right? All, all, all space available when the, there's also different theories, but there's a, one theory that, said, that says that the Portuguese were the first ones to uh, occupy the island and, and live there. And according to this theory, why, why should one choose a frequently floodable area to build the, the houses? Of course, the other theories say, well, houses, uh, water was very important for, to, to, to water supply, for example, drinking water, or for, for a meal to, to have some kind of energy. And, but she tried to, to show that nobody has yet tried to understand the magnitude and the frequency of the floods in this area. Into the flood models. Into the flood models. And this is why I teamed up with, with Antonieta, well, in a family lunch or family dinner after her PhD. I said, well, why, why not? Why don't we try to also bring evidence from the modeling results into this uh, theory or into this hypothesis? And this is where we've done. So she brought evidence from history, some documents saying that it started here or started there. And I just uh, took what we do normally for modeling floods. So uh, the topography of, the, of this area of the city without buildings, and then we start putting buildings and so on. And we, we could show based on the, on the modeling results that even for small uh, rainfall events, this place, this Praça Velha, this square, uh, gets flooded frequently. Nowadays, there's a sewer system taking care of these floods, this storm water, so we don't see it uh, frequently. But in the last few years, there's a few events that we see water flowing to the, to the square and then flowing downstream to the sea. So it was a very, very interesting work. And I'm very proud uh, to team up with, uh, with Antonieta and linking, I would say, fancy hydraulic, hydrological models with historical evidence. It's a great interdisciplinary collaboration, good chance to show what some technical models can do in supporting other kinds of disciplines like architecture, like history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to clarify, and these are not the really detailed hydraulic models because back in the day you wouldn't have had your sewer systems well documented or in this case drainage systems well documented, but these are more overland flow, more simplistic kind of approaches. Yeah, yeah. This was completely overland flow because there was no underground system by that time. That's very clear. So we are not, we can really disregard or yeah, disregard this thing we, or discard this thing, sorry, Th these, these underground systems. 
for this particular study, basically what we had was the overland flow and the creeks, the creeks that would be most of the time knowing the, the geology and topography of the island, most of the time dry, and then they get water when it rains. Yep. So in this case, not having the underground drainage network was not a problem at all for the for the simulations. But as you mentioned, for what we do nowadays, connecting the overland flow with the underground pipes, it's in many cases essential key. You find it's still a very important aspect to consider, particularly in the planning side when we have to make sure our models are accurate enough. Yes, uh, I think this dual drainage aspect is two sides. One, we can argue that if the rainfall intensity is too high, they play a relatively small role because they are designed for a specific intensity. And then above this intensity, they still play a role, but it will be relatively small. But on the other side, I think it's still very relevant to consider them properly to a certain level of detail because the stormwater or the wastewater or the mixed water traveling in these, in these systems, they usually travel much faster than overland flow. And what these systems can produce is problematic problems in specific areas that without these systems would not happen. Problems like flooding or flooding episodes. So in that sense, it's it's important to, to consider both at the same time in, in parallel. But of course, one of the issues that arises when you try to set up such a model, and this is apparent in this historical study, but also in many other studies that you've been a part of recently as well, is the question of data. And especially with flood models, data is often a very limited thing. We don't have, well, sometimes we're missing the data we need to set up our models, but we also miss the data that we need to validate our models. And so there's two two sort of pathways in particular that you've taken, one being data-driven flood models, as well as the other one looking at different sources of data. I guess let's focus our attention on this idea of data-driven flood models. Um, tell me a bit about them. What are they? Okay. Well, if you want, uh, I think I'm going to upset many people now. <laughs> uh, but let's see. Basically, what we are doing with uh, with colleagues from ETH Zurich as well. So we are training a complex network. In this case, a convolutional neural network. We can call it artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, data driven, deep learning, uh, whatever. But basically, we train a structure that is capable of learning or at least to reproduce something based on data. So this is what we try to do. And there's been quite uh, interesting developments uh, on these over the last two, three years. So we've been working on these. Also, other colleagues from uh, DTU, for example, also submitted and published something similar and very interesting. Just for the listeners, DTU is the uh, Danish Technical University. Exactly. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I should technical have University of Denmark. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's potential there, clearly, I think. And of course, I don't advocate that we should move all attention to, let's say, data-driven models and forget the physically based models. It's clearly not the, not what I think, but in some applications, these data-driven models have a huge potential. For example, in if we want to predict pluvial floods, because physical-based models, because of this level of detail that we mentioned before, so the underground connected to the overland flow, and then the numerical methods associated with these, they will take quite some time to run. And when we would have the results of the predictions, most likely the flood will have gone. So we need something fast. And this is a way to have something fast. And basically, as and as I said, other people, other colleagues, we generate models, data-driven models, based on deep learning uh, architecture, that generate maps with water depth and velocity, velocity fields. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is something that I've been working on. I'm very pleased. And then I think for the next step, we'll be really trying to connect and to build a forecasting system from rainfall forecast to really sending a uh, flood alert at the end. So this is in the pipeline. And so just to give a perspective, these data-driven models, they run at a much faster rate than your traditional flood models. Yes, so physical-based models for relatively small areas in the city will take from a few minutes. We're talking about uh, normal desktops, mm -hmm. laptops as well. From a few minutes, dozens of minutes, to a couple of hours. And these events, they happen sometimes in half an hour, and it's very difficult to predict. So in that sense, we do need these fast models. And these data-driven models, they can predict, they can generate results in about a couple of seconds. So these give us the opportunity to, first of all, get flood predictions quite fast, but also run different setups of the model with different input data. And then we can have an ensemble. We can also estimate 
get, get an idea of the uncertainty of the model and so on. So I think for this specific application is, is really a nice tool. And do you think they will ever replace our physically based flood models? I suppose, given that you need these physically based models to train these data driven models, probably not so much. No, I think we're going to stay and use physically based models and not only to train the fast data-driven models. There's a few things if you want to understand what really happens when we change something in our system, then we do need a physically based model. If we remove a pipe, for example, and then want to see what is the implication, we should follow the physics. Of course, these physically based models are in principle more accurate, but they're also over-parameterized and there's lots of uncertainties in these parameters. So it's always a balance. Model complexity, also data availability, and we should not forget the application. Yeah, no, that's very true. And I think there's a bit too much of a reliance or it's becoming a huge reliance on machine learning approaches nowadays that we tend to forget that we still have this valuable gem of a physically based model that can really teach us a lot about the processes that are inherent to the system. And if you really want to understand the processes, we, de we do need a physically based model. Because in a data-driven model, in a neural network, we don't know what is inside. Yeah. It's kind of a gray or a black box that it reproduces results, I would dare to say, accurately. So they are nice tools to play with, to use, but they do not replace the more traditional physically based models. But nevertheless, machine learning can also lend itself to other kinds of useful aspects to solving the knowledge gaps that we have in flood modeling, flood risk assessment. Uh, one in particular, and this is really the other angle that you've looked at, is the utilization of alternative kinds of data sources, such as social media. Um, to help validate these models. Yes. Yeah, so although we are in these digital transition times or digitalization becomes a very word or we have digital twins of almost everything, we don't have data for floods or we have very limited data. It's more correct to say this. So when we look back into what has been the, the sensors and the data that we know that we usually get out of these drainage systems, we do have flow in pipes, water level in pipes. But for various reasons, on the overland part of the drainage system, there's very little. These reasons we can think about, well, in the pipes, we have always water flowing, or most of the times water is flowing in the pipes. So it, it's okay to put something there. For floods, uh, luckily, the drainage systems in cities help us not having floods every week or every month. So what is the incentive to put a sensor there to, that needs to be maintained for long time? to pick or to send something that happens two hours every five years or every 10 years. It's, it's, it's difficult to convince, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is when we have sensors in pipes, they are somehow confined, right? There's not many people going there. It's not a nice place to go, right? That is true. Overland, if we could put similar sensors next to the street curb, but if it will be accessed by or available to everyone, and then we know that uh, after a few days or a few weeks, some people are curious, would like to see what this thing is and take it away and then it doesn't work. So I think this is the two main reasons why we don't have... Uh, ah, and uh, we, we could also think about remote sensing, right? Mm -hmm. But for these specific types of floods, we'd be very, very lucky that the, the, the constellation of satellites would be looking exactly into where the fluvial floods happen. They are very localized and then they, they are very short-lived. So yeah, It's very hard to get the timing. Exactly. Because these satellites are normally globally, so they are traveling across the planet and will have certain schedules uh, exactly. yeah, upon which they pass over the areas that you're interested in. Yeah, yeah, they can be on the other side when the flood, the other side of the globe when the flood is happening. So it's not easy. And this was really one of the research gaps or the things that I thought, well, we do need data. We do need data to train the models. We need data to calibrate our models. So what do we do? And then uh, with, uh, with Matthew Moidivitri, that did a PhD in my group, I finished a couple of years ago. We embarked in this journey to try to grab as much data as possible using, I would call it now, non-conventional methods. So no pressure, no acoustic sensors, but with images and take advantage of computer vision algorithms to really extract data or obtain flood data. And for this, uh, we did explore social media on one hand to see people have this tendency to take pictures in these flood events they like. And we also with colleagues from ETH Zurich and a master student, Priyanka Chaudhary, we did develop a way to, based on elements in flooded images, 
we could estimate uh, the water depth. And I was looking at one of your papers and you had a picture of a bicycle that was basically submerged or people submerged in water wading through the floodwaters. Yeah, so the, the rationale is that people plus minus a few centimeters, bicycles plus minus a few centimeters, they all have more or less the same size. More or less, of course. There are uh, very, some variability, right? Taller people, shorter people. That's true. Uh, larger bicycles, smaller bicycles. So we took people. And we said, I think if I remember correctly, that the average person would have uh, would be one, se one meter 75 centimeters tall. Bicycles, I don't remember the, the dimensions. We also took cars okay, yep. and uh, houses, buildings and buses. And we sort of uh, standardized the sizes of these elements. So th what the method does, so it uh, classifies in the image what is water, what is not water in one first step. In the second step, Try to, uh, tries to identify these objects, bicycles, cars, people, and so on. And then what it does, based on these standardized dimensions, if we can measure, let's say, if we can see water up to the knee, this, this is equivalent to 40 centimeters of water. So we divided these objects in, in several classes. And then we say, well, based on these objects within this image, we say that the water depth is 40 centimeters, for example, plus minus five centimeters. Okay, so you have some uncertainty bounds on your yes. standard model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because we, we have classes of uh, water depth, not exact values. But uh, the results, and then as you could, I think, uh, read, uh, in, read in the paper, are quite accurate. So we are not very far. We have to say, I have to say that there's still limitations and challenges. So one, one obvious one is if in the foreground we have a person with water up to the knee and then in the background we have a car outside the water, what is the water level in this image? So we need to find a way to disentangle these things and understand that maybe the car is, is above a bridge, for example, and the person is, is uh, in a train depression. Yeah. So there's still things that need to be done, but still we prove that this is a possible way to, to obtain flood data. I suppose that's always the, the interesting conflict you have with these methods. We try to simplify them to a certain extent and use some basic logical ways of going about it. But then you'll end up with edge cases like the bridge example, when we start to think of the 3D landscape um, and things don't become as simple as just saying, well, spot the car, spot the water. Correct. Fully agree with that. But this is also part of the research, right? Of course. We go step by step and hopefully the next PhD student, the next, next master student that comes in and takes this problem uh, in uh, his or her hands can really solve this other thing and discover another challenge. So this is the way I see research and this is the, the part of the fun of doing uh, research. Yeah. And to all the listeners, any references we've made to publications we'll put in the show notes so you'll be able to find more about Trau's work by looking at the show notes. This has been really, really insightful. I've been learning a lot and in a way it's been a lot of fun to really hear more in depth about the work you've been doing. I, I also have some questions to, to ask you to reflect a bit about your journey through yep. your research. Namely, I guess, what inspires you to be a researcher and to do what you do? We talked a bit about your, your, um, your background, where you grew up, but are there any other elements that really inspire you to do what you do? Well, uh, we've discussed this thing briefly before. And I went home uh, thinking, because I don't have an answer for that, honestly, or an easy answer or a, or a nice answer. But I was reflecting a little bit. So I think this, is, this has to do with personality first. One should be open for these challenges and these unknowns. But also uh, the way we grow and to the things we are exposed may have some influence. And I, I, I do remember some teachers at high school that some of them, I don't remember the name, but uh, some of them, I still do remember the name. And one specific teacher, I don't know exactly in which context, but I remember was a relatively young teacher recently out of the university that has studied biology and geology. Her name is Alda something. I forgot the surname. Uh, sorry for that, uh, teacher Alda or uh, Stora Alda, as we say in Portugal. And she recommended a book called uh, The Adventure of Life that I have completely forgotten for the last 10 or 15 years. And the book is, uh, the author is uh, Joel de Rosnay. He was a, a very, he's a very famous scientist, now retired. He worked in France, in the US, in MIT, for example. And I think this was one of the first books that really triggered my, my interest, my, my, my curiosity about uh, science. Yeah, I think this is, this is a, an honest answer. 
the book's called The Adventure of Life. The Adventure of Life. Yeah. That'd be very interesting. It's only in Portuguese? No, no, this is a, this is a, I got a version, a translated version in Portuguese, but I think the original version is in French Okay. and it's translated in English. So I, I, I should know the, the original title of the book. I was not there to say such a thing yeah. in French now because I, but uh, if you, if you search for the, uh, the adventure of life, Joël uh, de Rosnay, mm-hmm. you will find, uh, you find the book. And I'm sure we'll we'll find the link and put it in the show notes as well. And you, you sort of mentioned that book that's had a huge impact on you. Are there any other books, people, presentations or seminars or anything that you've come across that really changed your the trajectory of your career, your mindset? Well, I already mentioned uh, Professor Antonio Quintella about the, the hydraulics professor. And I have to say also Professor José Saldanha March also mentioned his name before. And I think they do had a kind of an impact on on my curiosity, on my interest on, on, on science and research. I don't remember now any conference or workshop or seminar that really, really caught my attention. But definitely these people and people and the, this book specifically, people do have a very important place in my life, I have to say, more than the, the seminar, than the workshop and so on. So uh, yeah, these, these people and many other people at early stage of my science career that also had an impact but uh, these two i think uh, have a have a some share of responsibility yeah you meet different people along your journey and many become mentors for life oh yeah oh yeah yeah oh, yeah so also i learned a lot with professor chedo maximovic my phd supervisor also we also learned to to disagree which was a, li- a really good lesson for life uh, it was really really interesting time at imperial college during the phd also learned a lot my with my co-supervisor Mm-hmm. Uh, Dusan Prodanovic, to whom I really be very thankful about the support I got for the PhD. And uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, this this is always very tricky to to name people because there's always someone that one forgets. You run the risk of forgetting someone. And this is really, yeah, tough. But no ill intentions there either. No, no, not, not at all. So, but also other people creating opportunities for the development after the PhD in Lisbon, in Switzerland. So you need to be very uh, acknowledgeable about these these people and these, these opportunities. Yeah. And you moved around quite a lot and you've published really broadly and quite, um, yeah, quite actively as well. Uh, well. Can you tell me a bit about uh, what was the most challenging situation or aspect you've ever faced in your career and what did you do to overcome it? Well, I think challenges that that we do face as researchers, and we talked about this this publication, this paper about uh, the floods and history in Terceira. And I do think that everyone who works in these interdisciplinary topics or try to to bring inter- interdisciplinarity into the work faces always a challenge. That it's usually it's not enough in one topic, it's not enough in the other topic. Yeah, but that's not the point. The point is really to bridging two or more topics and bringing them together and then try to do something really new and novel and, and interesting. And uh, this is in some way one of the challenges. So who am I? I'm a geographer? No, um, I, I did study GIS. I am a, a lab person on looking into chemistry and, and biology in the lab as I've studied in, at university. No, I'm not. Uh, so I'm some someone between the geographic, uh, the GIS, geographic information science, on flooding as well. So the big focus is on flooding in urban areas, urban hydrology. But then it's difficult to really sometimes sell this 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 profile or to present. It's something, it's a mix. But it's very interesting. So it's it's not clear sometimes, but it's very interesting to have these uh, these uh, different uh, interests and also opportunities to to explore. I guess it's also because of the challenge you have. You just have to persevere. You got to tell yourself to keep going and really show that you you have something to give by delivering the intersection of the different disciplines. Yeah. First of all, it's very fun. <laughs> first I, of I all, this, agree is, with that. this is really cool because we talk to other people and bring different expertise together. And then, yeah, this is really what really uh, moves me forward. Uh, but at some times when we, when a student or with, 
or when I try to submit a paper and then get it published, ah, oh, no, it's not enough. You should have included the, the details here. But also on the other side, it's not enough because it gets a little bit frustrating. But this is part of life, and then we we learn how to deal with these things. Yeah, but I would also agree. I feel I work across disciplines, and I feel that you have something to learn in terms of how you think about a problem based on the discipline that you're in. And if you have the chance to really expose yourself to different disciplines and learn the different ways of thinking, you'll be able to gain that ability to analyze something from so many perspectives. And often that integrated view gives you much more than, you know, just thinking as a traditional engineer, as you said, where we're neither exact or what was it just now when you said we're neither exact nor I'm trying to remember what you said at the start of the. Uh, you, an engineer should never say never and oh, yeah. should never say always. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, <laughs> so as you mentioned earlier, an engineer we should never say never and never say always. We're sort of always in between that vagueness, but I guess different disciplines would think like that too. So yeah, 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 yeah. There's certainly a lot of benefit there. And I can add here that uh, the things that we've been doing in the last couple of years or or a few years, really stays in this fuzzy area of interdisciplinarity, but it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> really, and, really fun. And you and I have been working together a lot in the last few years, and it's been absolutely enjoyable yeah, in that definitely. regard. Um, in terms of time management, because there's a lot to to deal with in research, Like, do you have any advice you can offer in terms of time management? How do you balance your professional, personal life? I think this is not a challenge of, uh, of the researchers or professors or whatever. It's the challenge of the current times. There's many demands around us and it's very difficult to say no. And I know a person that is very good in saying no. And we, I try to learn a little bit from him. Yeah. It's a colleague of us at Evag, and I think he's very strategic in saying no. So saying no is really one of the key uh, solutions for all these overwhelming uh, number of demands that they are all interesting, but we only have 24 hours and we have many more things going on outside the professional life. And we sometimes wish the day would have 48 hours. Oh, yeah. But, but we, that, that might be a disservice to us. <laughs> yes. No, no. It, it will not be a solution. Uh, because this thing will keep going and keep piling up. So I think the, the, I'm not very good in saying no, I have to say. Like, well, I'm not very good in saying no, but I'm trying to learn. It's important. It's very important. And apart from that kind of advice, what other advice can you offer to young people starting out in research, beginning their research careers, whether it's embarking on a master's or a PhD or even just fresh from a PhD? Well, I, I'm going to repeat something that you have he heard from me several times. First of all, do things that you really close to your heart. So if you choose a topic for a PhD or for a master, choose something that you see yourself working 48 hours per day. <laughs> <laughs> that you don't get tired. And this is part of the, I'm pretty sure of big share of the success of the master thesis or PhD. If you really like what you're doing, the topic, also you have to be lucky with the team you are involved with and uh, the context and atmosphere and so on. But if you really like the topic, you will push the topic forward, no doubt. So this is the only advice I would, I would say. Just do something that is very close to your heart, whatever. Yeah, I think that's splendid advice. Joao, thank you very much for your time and agreeing to come on the show. And thank you to you listeners for your time and company in this very insightful and engaging conversation with Joao. Uh, if you'd like to follow Joao, you can reach him on where, where can people reach you or where can people get in touch? Yes. So because of these time management things, I'm a little bit limited in terms of how you can find me. So I'm not very active in the social media platforms, but if you search my name, you'h uh, will find my webpage on uh, AIRVAG uh, website and there you, you can find all the information and please do contact me if you can. If you have something to discuss, I'll be very open from uh, court, salted court in Portugal to the tough times finding a car in, in the Azores or uh, also uh, the topics, research topics that we've uh, just uh, touched upon and this and more information as well as links to any papers documents that we've discussed will be in the show notes but Jrao, i'll leave it to you famous last words one message for listeners to take away from today enjoy your life the best way you can that's it i think this is very important whatever topic whatever activity whatever side activity yeah find uh, enjoy the best uh, possible way thank you very much and thank you to you listeners for tuning in to this fun and engaging conversation with Dr. Joao Paulo Leitao. 
As mentioned, you can find links to papers, books, and salted cod and olive oil recipes in our show notes over at peterambach.com slash podcast. If you enjoyed this show and are looking forward to more episodes, please do subscribe or follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you are listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. I would be incredibly grateful for this as it helps me to reach a broader audience and, who knows, perhaps inspire a greater uptake and collection of unconventional data sources that can help us answer the deepest and best-kept secrets in our city's histories or anticipate and predict the next major flood. If you'd like to know more about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website at petermbach.com, my YouTube channel, Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on Twitter at Peter M. Bach or Instagram at Peter M. Bach 87 if you have feedback or suggestions or just know someone who has an inspiring story to offer, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. The podcast's intro and outro song is called Bucolia by Bureaucratic. Stay tuned for our next episode and next guest to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges. 